Plugged In Podcast, presented by the Institute for Energy Research. To find out more about our work, visit our website at instituteforenergyresearch.org. Welcome to the Plugged In Podcast. I'm your host, Paige Lambermont. I'm a policy associate here at the Institute for Energy Research. And I'm Jordan McGillis, Deputy Director of Policy here at IER. Joining us today is Adam Thierer, a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. He specializes in innovation, entrepreneurialism, internet, and free speech issues, with a particular focus on the public policy concerns surrounding emerging, emerging technologies. He has authored or edited eight books on topics ranging from media regulation and child safety issues to the role of federalism in high technology markets. His latest book, Permissionless Innovation, The Continuing Case for Comprehensive Technological Freedom. Previously, he was president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation, director of telecommunications studies at the Cato Institute, and a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. He received his MA in international business management and trade theory at the University of Maryland, and his BA in journalism and political philosophy from Indiana University. Thanks for joining us today, Adam. Thanks for having me. Okay, so uh, to start us off, could you kind of just describe the concepts of the precautionary principle and of permissionless innovation for our listeners so that we can have kind of common terminology going into this? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I've spent about 30 years now covering the public policy ramifications of various emerging technologies and their sectors. And in each and every one of the debates and technologies that I covered, I came to notice that there were sort of two deep underlying philosophies or governing principles that were really operating in all of these debates. One of them was easy to define because it really was a philosophy that came out of the field of environmental science. And that philosophy or governance principle was the precautionary principle. Precautionary principle basically stands for the idea that new innovation should not be allowed into the wild until such time as its creator can prove to the world that it's perfectly safe. Until then, Caution is the governing principle, and better to be safe than sorry, as the philosophy goes. Well, the, the opposite of the precautionary principle is, was a little bit harder to define, and I really couldn't find a suitable label for it. But because I do most of my work in the field of information and communications technologies, and the internet uh, world uh, in particular, I came to realize that the idea of permissionless innovation might be a good antithesis of the precautionary principle. We don't really know who coined the term permissionless innovation. I certainly did not. If anybody you're out there in your listening audience knows, please let me know, because I've been searching for many years to try to figure out who to attribute this phrase to. I'm ready to give you full credit if you want it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. But uh, in reality, uh, permissionless innovation is a really nice term because it, it is very, very clear what it means just by looking at it, right? We want to innovate without prior restraint or prior permission. We want to allow people to go out and experiment with new and better ways of doing things without being restrained by top-down command and control regulations of a precautionary variety. And so this conflict of visions, if you will, I have found dominates each and every debate about technological innovation. Right on down through today, I'm writing a, a filing right now about new principles from the Trump administration on governing artificial intelligence. And very, very clearly in the language there, it says we should be careful about a precautionary approach and consider one that is more open and embraces innovation. There, once again, is this dichotomy, this division between the precautionary principle and permissionless innovation. Wow, that's really cool. For us, it's super interesting to be able to look at the economic underpinning of the sort of energy policy we like to put forward. So not just looking at what a good policy idea is, what makes it function well in the economy, what makes it good for people. Um, and so the ability to talk about this is um, really exciting for us. So I was wondering how you first became interested in this topic. Um, like, What kind of sparked your interest? Sure. Well, as a young boy in the in the 1970s, yes, I'm that crusty of a critter. I uh, was a, a real science nerd and really uh, enjoyed science fairs. Uh, not too many kids who probably say that, but I was one of them. And I did fairly well in the science fairs. And then one year I decided after being prompted by uh, a relative of mine who worked at the Oak Ridge Nuclear Facility in Tennessee to consider doing something about nuclear power which would be a very difficult one to do because I couldn't really do a natural experiment of any sort as part of my project. <laughs> I did put together, however, uh, a pretty slick uh, presentation, and he provided me with a lot of wonderful materials direct from the lab. So this was great uh, to have stuff from Oak Ridge declassified, I think. <laughs> okay, so no one was sent to a federal prison as no, a result of this? No, no, no. It was okay. all good. 
Um, and I was all of about 10 years old at the time, so I probably couldn't even pronounce half the words that were in the documents. Uh, but I did quite well, and I advanced through the science fairs and up into a regional competition, and two of the three judges said very nice things. And then a third judge approached me and to evaluate my presentation and really gave me a lot of grief. And it was very, very clear that she was fundamentally hostile to nuclear technologies and nuclear power in particular. And she was not going to have me saying anything to counter that. <laughs> so much so that I think she single-handedly probably uh, derailed my entire presentation and my ability to advance because I was about ready to cry after she was uh, grilling me for so long. And I recognized many years later, and my, uh, my relative at the time told me, like, there are just some people who, for whatever reason, can't accept a break with the status quo with new technologies that entail a certain amount of risk um, because they're just too fearful of the ramifications, even if there may be profound benefits associated with them. And many, many, many years later, as I went on to study political philosophy and political science, I came to realize that there was an entire genre of writing that reflected that. The best of which was a book that I read exactly 10 years after doing that presentation as a young boy. When I was in college, I read a book by a political scientist named Aaron Wodolsky called Searching for Safety, published in 1988. Completely changed my entire life and immediately shaped my thinking about risk analysis and the way I was going to evaluate technological change. Because Wodolsky wrote probably what is the most powerful refutation of the precautionary principle in that book. And Wodolsky said, I'm just going to quote from the book really briefly because it's very powerful. Uh, he basically made the point that the problem with the precautionary principle is that really what it is, is trial without error. We always talk about trial and error, trial with error. But he says the precautionary principle is trial without error reasoning. It basically says that you cannot try anything. It paralyzes us in inaction in the status quo. And he said, and I'm going to quote this directly, the direct implication of trial without error is obvious. If you can do nothing without knowing first how it will turn out, you cannot do anything at all. And the indirect implication of trial without error is that if trying new things is made more costly, there will be fewer departures from past practice. And this very lack of change, he said, may be dangerous and foregoing chances to reduce existing hazard, hazards. He was basically saying that the precautionary principle, based on the well-intentioned reasoning that we need to keep everything safe, actually makes us less safe. And man, that was an epiphany for me. That was a real eye opener. I said, that is the right framing. It's risk-risk analysis. It's trade-offs. It's opportunity cost. That was my language. And that forever then shaped how I consider as a policy analyst all new emerging technologies and their regulation thereof. Wow, that's really interesting. I think it's, it's, it's nice to notice that not only do actions have externalities, but inaction also has an externality, which we don't really think about. Like, the maintenance of the status quo doesn't seem to be an action, but it is a choice, and Absolutely. it does have results. Um, Absolutely. In fact, uh, back in my younger years, I was in Catholic schools raised by Jesuits, and I became familiar with uh, the work of St. Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas uh, once famously said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that if the sole goal of a captain was to make sure that his ship never sank, he'd never leave port. But of course, that's not the sole goal of a captain. A captain wants to go out and brave the high seas and take risks because only by taking risks do you find any rewards. Sometimes they're monetary in character. Sometimes they're the glory of exploring new worlds. For whatever reasons, people leave harbor. And that's the exact thinking that drives permissionless innovation. The idea that only by taking some risks can we get some rewards through societal learning that trial and error, we forget about the error part of it and how much we learn from our failures so that we don't make them again. Something I'm contemplating here as you're talking is private assumption of risk and personal risk preferences versus public policy and how you balance or otherwise negotiate those differing risk preferences that we all have. Absolutely. That comes down to a serious uh, form of risk analysis that we've been luckily engaged in now for many decades in this country and in others, where we attempt to try to model these regulatory trade-offs society-wide. Now, this isn't easy. It's extraordinarily controversial, remains so today. The very act of putting a, a statistical value on human life or on the environment or on animals or endangered species, um, or in my area, things like online safety, digital privacy. These are all important values these are all things that society cares about.
But we have to understand we have cer only certain resources and we have to trade off among these different choices and resources and make the best decisions and get the best bang for our buck. And so we can go well beyond individual preferences and talk about all of the societal ones, but we can't lose sight of the fact that we're in it together and we have to make some tough calls. What Aaron Wodolsky and a whole generation of risk analysts did after his work is to try to formalize that sort of risk analysis. Again, it continues to be controversial today, but it's absolutely essential. What I'm saying in my work and a lot of other people are saying about the precautionary principle is that that's generally speaking not our best place to start. It's not the proper governance default. We want something more akin to permissionless innovation because we believe in the power of learning through trial and error. But it doesn't mean we should always have perfectly permissionless innovation. There are plenty of cases where a precautionary approach is probably more sound. But this is the, this is the heart of all debates about technological innovation. Where do you set the default and who sets it? Yeah, I think that's a very important thing to think about because sometimes we tend towards this idea that the rules are the rules, the regulations are always made the same way. Um, you know, the problem will be solved by someone. And we fail to think about who specifically is in charge of making sure that that happens, what like what regulatory body should be doing it. Um, and often that leads to overregulation by kind of a crowd where too many agencies, too many different other things are taking control of issues instead of leaving them to kind of one natural thing that should be solving. Yeah, that or they're problem. locking regulations in stone, sort of set it and forget it policy making, which is the worst, right? We need to constantly be reevaluating our choices and our trade offs and considering whether we've made bad decisions in the past. In the field of environmental policy, that's clearly the case with something like nuclear energy, where I think still the bias that I saw in the late 70s is still there today and having profound ramifications for society. Yeah, the regulation very rarely manages to advance at the same rate as the technology does. It, in fact, it almost never ever does. <laughs> yeah. This is what's called in the field of the philosophy of technology, this is what's called the pacing problem. And the pacing problem refers to the idea that technological innovation tends to unfold at a much more rapid clip than public policy's ability to keep up, and that gap is broadening, widening every single year. And the pacing problem has become the fundamental driver of rethinking regulation because it used to be that a lot of agencies and bureaucrats could just sit around and say, eh, we'll get to this some other day, so what? They, the, the costs weren't being absorbed and they weren't being forgotten because you still had to go to that agency and petition for freedoms and operational permits and so on. Today, technology can pass you right by. And if it doesn't pass you by in this country, it'll pass you by somewhere else because we live in a world of global innovation arbitrage where innovation and innovators tend to move to wherever they're treated most hospitably. Where are they moving right now? Well, it depends on the technology, and it's not one single answer, but if you ask me it's something like, what's happening in the field of like genetic sciences and, and uh, biotechnology? I would say China's eating our lunch. There's a lot of really interesting innovation happening there that's not happening here. Uh, likewise, I've, I've documented in my own work what's happening in the field of unmanned aerial systems or drones where we started to see because of heavy-handed top-down regulation by our Federal Aviation Administration that folks like Amazon and Google and many other drone innovators started going overseas to the UK and to Australia to try to engage in like drone delivery. There were actually blood being delivered in certain island areas in, uh, in East Asian countries by drones to remote islands. Could never ever happen here in the United States. Flatly illegal. Happening there every day out there. So the same way it's happening in deserts in Africa and, and so on and so forth. So innovation arbitrage very much depends on what we're talking about because we've been on the benefit. We've been the benefits of positive inflows of capital and, and, and talent when it comes to Internet and information technologies. This is the story uh, that I tell in my book on permissionless innovation, where America completely dominated the world in terms of the e-commerce revolution, and the digital revolution. I often ask uh, students in classrooms, I say, can anyone here name a single major company in the ICT space, information communications technology space, that is based in Europe? And they really, really struggle. The best answer they come up with usually is Spotify. But I'm like, well, I'll give you Spotify. Can you give me another? And they usually say something like Skype. I said, that's been owned by American companies for 10 years <laughs> plus. And they'll say something like Deutsche Telekom. I said, that's a former state-owned enterprise. Don't give me that. Anything else. And they, and they can't come up with it because... America's digital companies are household names across the globe because we got our policy default right. It was closer to permissionless innovation. Overseas in Europe and in many other countries and continents, 
it was thou shall not sort of precautionary restrictions across the board before you could do anything in the internet space, and that failed. So how do we write policy that allows for, for permissionless innovation? It's tricky, um, and it can't be the same in every area. If we're talking about something like pharmaceuticals, there clearly is going to be a higher level of precaution, as there should be with regards to review of certain types of pharmaceuticals or medical devices. Um, it's the same goes for aviation for the most part. Um, and there's several other fields like that where we can definitely raise the bar and say, there we're going to have to be more precautionary. But even there, we need to be constantly evaluating our trade-offs. Um, because sometimes, even though precaution is necessary, it can have profound costs relative to the options. Let's go back to nuclear power and, and keep this rooted in energy and environment issues. There have been some really important studies done recently. In fact, late last year, two were released on NVER, which is a major economics research uh, uh, site, that had to do with the trade-offs associate, associated with the Fukushima uh, accident uh, in Japan. And it wasn't just what happened in Japan and the cost thereof, but it was also what happened globally because of it. So in Japan, one study found in the four-year period following that accident, the Japanese government zeroed out nuclear power. And it had, according to these authors of this report during that period, uh, the effect of having 1,280 cold weather-related deaths due to the government's decision to completely end nuclear power. And that it also resulted in a massive spike in prices across the board and then a substitution of other types of energy and use mostly fossil fuels for nuclear power, which could have had other consequences they didn't model. But that wasn't the end of the story. Many other governments reacted in a precautionary way. All the way over in Europe, Germany cut its nuclear production by half following the disaster. And the study that came out last December on that by three authors revealed that the phase out, phase out cost 12 billion per year, 70% of the cost due to increased mortality risk from local air pollution because of the switch to fossil fuels. And that's more than a, 1,100 deaths per year, they estimated. Can that you help us really... understand the death estimates that are put forward in papers like these? Sure. Yeah, basically these studies try to take a look, they try to model real world uh, results or negative outcomes associated with policy uh, decisions and trade-offs. And so they look at something like, okay, there's been a, so back, back to the, the example of what happened in Japan. There has been, uh, the, the electricity price hikes in the country went from 30% nuclear uh, power production to zero in just 14 months. In that, in that time, the cost of electricity went up considerably for your average Japanese household. That's gonna have important ramifications. There are going to be people who are living maybe at a, at a level that they can't afford that kind of increase that goes along with it. There may just be other types of things associated with it, like uh, the, there may be power outages, the inability to actually keep up with demand. And all of a sudden, one cold night, your power goes off completely. If you're an elderly person with nobody to help you out, that can have fatal consequences. What these authors have done is they've attempted to model this using the best data that's available. Now, there always are going to be debates about causal connections. Um, and, and correlation is not causation, of course. So you have to be careful about doing modeling like this. But these are both respected uh, papers on respected sites that have been peer reviewed. And so there has to probably be something to this logic that there were consequences associated with zeroing out nuclear power, and especially the, the in causal, countries highly dependent. The causal chain theoretically is that uh, with the elimination of the nuclear power, um, Japan has to respond by putting other sources of power into use that are driving up the cost on the margin to people uh, throughout the country and that they can't then afford to use the energy or they have right. averages. And so there are people who effectively have, have cold-related deaths sure. because they can't run their heater. That's it's mostly cold-weather-related deaths. It could mm -hmm. be the opposite. It could be hot-weather-related mm -hmm. deaths with lack of air, air conditioning. There have been deaths in this country when there's been heat waves and people's power have gone Summer out. Summer in Okinawa, you might, you might have some hot-weather deaths down there. Yeah, I mean, I remember this happening as a, as a youth in just Chicago. You know, it happens in even northern cities when power goes out for long periods. Europe has had some real trouble with that because they don't have the, the same adoption of air conditioning that we have um, when they've had some heat waves in the summer, uh, cities like Paris just mass elderly uh, die off because yeah. they're not prepared for it. Well, in, in this case, in the, in the Japanese example, it wasn't just that. That was, that was a sort of indirect effect. The direct effect right up front was the relocation of so many people. And a lot of these people were in nursing homes or they were in homes that had certain facilities that were there for them to keep them functioning and alive. 
And all of a sudden, you're completely upended overnight and moved. Now, of course, they had to be. They had yeah. to be, right? There was, there was fallout. There was, there was a, a dangerous situation. But these authors point out that studies on this still have not found any statistically significant deaths associated with radiation exposure. But there have been deaths attributed to the move itself and to the later cold weather related uh, reports of illness and disease. Uh, just a few things on that. Um, so there have been kind of uh, disagreements over how big the evacuation zone should have been, even under the like rules that they were following how big they should have been, and that there might have been sort of political reasons rather than scientific reasons or policy reasons that people, that they set the zone where they set it. Sure. Um, and also, there were rules in place in hospitals there that right after an earthquake, you couldn't use an elevator. But they were evacuating everyone, and a lot of people couldn't t go down the stairs on their own. So there were a lot of deaths from people even being That's dropped wrong. or yeah. that sort of thing right. because they wouldn't use the working elevators in these buildings because the rules said that they couldn't while they were also evacuating. Right. And it's just interesting. I mean, what we're getting at here is that even the most well-intentioned of regulations can have very unintended consequences. And those unintended consequences at the extreme can include death. And this is the, the point I've been trying to make in my writing about the precautionary principle, because the precautionary principle often gets a free pass because it's well-intentioned. But as one of my heroes, uh, the political scientist Thomas Sowell, uh, often says, you know, uh, well-intentions can only get you so far in this world. That, you, you know, the best of intentions can't excuse bad policy outcomes. It's results that ultimately matter most. We have to evaluate these things in a rational, level-headed way without any of these sort of ideological priors coming in. Because especially something like nuclear power, where there's clear all sorts of ideological priors come in, right? People just absolutely, hell no, we won't go kind of approach to nukes, to nuclear power. And I, I saw that as a young boy, as I pointed out, right? And there's a lot of wishful thinking about all the other alternatives that might be out there, but the reality is this one's here and now. We've got it. This is a very clean energy source, right? It, it's a cheaper one. And yet these trade-offs are now hitting us in the form of lives lost. It's not just pollution questions like it used to be in the old days. I made my case as a young boy in the 70s in that science fair project by saying this is how nuclear power can cut down on acid rain. But what's interesting about that, it was true, is that there was no discussion at the time about what it meant for global warming. So sometimes we can't even frame things within a, this is just a 40 year period, right? And get the science right like that. It takes a long time. You do your best, but you have to constantly reevaluate. Well, now we know what the ramifications are, right? Wherever you stand on global warming or the pollution, pollution associated with fossil fuels, the reality is we know nuclear power is cleaner and it's a choice that exists and we are foregoing it. In this country, no nuclear plants, plants can ever get built, basically. We just don't permit them. And we're basically riding on our past embedded success for wherever it's still out there. And this has had profound ramifications for our society and our environment. Something I find interesting is that this precautionary principle mindset really does seem to cut across our traditional right-left divide in the United States. There's Absolutely. not a clear this side or that side uh, to this tendency. Absolutely. And, and in fact, in my area of expertise, of internet policy, information communications, media policy, uh, I find strange bedfellows all the time in favor of precautionary principle. I can go back to the early work I did on things like uh, free speech on broadcast radio and television, where there were as many conservatives who favored censorship as there were liberals. I can cut all the way forward and talk about internet policy and about how people on the right now are more vociferous and advocating certain types of obligations on social media platforms to clean up their act or to try to like make it a more fair and balanced place for conservatives. And they want to like undo certain protections that social media platforms have or regulate them in new ways. The precautionary principle, it, it, it's, it's not affiliated with any one party. Clearly there are probably more Democrats, more left of center people who have an affinity for it than people on the right uh, of center. But the reality is, is it, ha it has friends all over the place. I want to bring up a related topic here that just sprung into my mind. Regulatory capture. How does that factor in? So regulatory capture is a topic I've done a lot of work on, and it basically refers to the idea that uh, if you establish a large enough regulatory agency or bureaucracy and a body of law, then eventually you will attract a lot of people who find that law to be beneficial from their perspective. It's easy to think of regulation as having 
costs for everyone because it usually does, but it also has potential benefits for some players. And so some of those players, specifically some very large interests and corporations, may glom onto certain regulations to protect them from new competition or new innovation. Probably the paradigmatic example from our own lifetimes recently would be something like what happened with the taxi and transportation and hospitality industry when Uber and Airbnb came in and disrupted that. For the better part of 70 years, economists and political scientists of both, both ideological dispositions and throughout agencies were all in agreement that taxi cab regulation at the local municipal level was essentially a cartelistic anti-consumer racket. It was raising costs, it was denying good service, poor quality, you know, didn't, wasn't doing any good whatsoever. And we could never ever reform these rules. Why? Because the taxi cab industry had the taxi cab commissions in their back pocket. It was complete blatant regulatory capture. All the economists and great reasoning in the world couldn't undo this mess. What undid it? Disruptive innovation. One day Uber came along for taxi service and Lyft uh, came along and then Airbnb for hospitality and said, you know, we're just going to do an end run around this. We're going to engage in what I call in my next book, evasive entrepreneurialism. We're going to basically make policy change part of our business model by being so disruptive that it will cut to the core of the law and challenge its morality and say, no, this is not good, not just for us, but for consumers. And now, of course, now that we've tasted the waters of what like more choice looks like for like hospitality and like taxis, we ain't going back, right? We're still going to regulate these things. We're still going to tax them. It's not like it's complete permissionless innovation, but we changed the dynamic of the old precautionary approach and we broke it. Specifically in those two areas, the hospitality and the transportation, there seems to be a really opportunistic activation of that precautionary principle on the part of uh, the taxi cartels or the hotels, they want people to feel there's a, ch a sense of danger and risk, risk that comes along with these new technologies. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's really amazing. I mean, this happens so often where you, you'll find large uh, vested interest in corporations who will try to play the safety card or the, some other card to say, like, if you do this, the, the sky will fall. You know, we'll, we'll be in a disastrous situation. There was a bill back in 2005 that I was writing a lot on that had a very simple kind of reform. It says, we're gonna open up the market for local news, weather, and sports to satellite radio providers like Sirius XM. <laughs> the broadcast industry went crazy. We can't have, but, you know, and what they were saying is like, we can't have that competition. But what they were saying is that if you allow them in here, it will undermine free over the air radio and television broadcasting, and there will be no more news, weather, traffic, or sports locally provided if we have that competition. The bill got over 400 sponsors in the house. <laughs> it, it, these are the kind of things that it, it ultimately didn't pass, luckily. But these are the kind of things that, again, go back to your point about like the nonpartisan nature of a lot of the precautionary principle reasoning and tie it into the regulatory capture and scare tactics, which are what fundamentally drive the application of the precautionary principle by default in so many areas. Luckily, in the United States, we've not always done that for a lot of sectors. A lot of sectors have been lucky enough to, as I call it, be born free of these sorts of preemptive precautionary restraints. But there's a handful that are more born into regulatory captivity. Like if you're a flying thing or a driving thing or a, a medical thing, you're gonna be immediately pigeonholed into some regulatory box of a very precautionary nature. That's why we're having really interesting debates right now about things like driverless cars, which is really a computer on wheels, right? which a computer isn't regulated. We don't have a federal computer commission. Internet computing, run wild, permissionless. But cars are heavily, heavily regulated, federal, state, local level. That's a collision of two regulatory paradigms, precautionless and uh, permissionless innovation, the precautionary principle. Will the automobile exception to the Fourth Amendment still apply for driverless vehicles if there's computers on wheels? Oh man, now we're getting really nerdy. Uh, that's good, that's a great question, and, and we don't know. We don't really know how it'll play out because if your car becomes, again, a computer on wheels, there's not only Fourth Amendment questions, but there's a whole host of other types of questions, like what's your privacy policy for your automobile? I once testified in a, a whole session at the Federal Trade Commission about just that. You know, How much information can your vehicle collect about you, and when and can it be shared or should it not be shared? Um, that's a really interesting question, right? The precautionary principle crowd would say, we should just stop any sort of information collection in your cars. Well, that's a horrible idea. I obviously don't want sh my personal thoughts that I'm you know, saying out loud in my car to be shared with anybody or my bad singing. <laughs> uh, 
but I also want my car to be able to collect certain information about me or certain things that I'm doing. Right now, my car collects information about me to give me a good driver discount through my insurer. And I voluntarily opt into that and get something good. I don't want that fully automated into a police state kind of thing where they can then shut down my car if I'm going over the speed limit. Right? We can strike that balance without saying stop all information collection in vehicles. That's why the precautionary principle is never an idea. It assumes that the worst case is the only case that matters. And as I said in my book on permissionless innovation, if you make worst case scenario thinking the basis of public policy, it means that no best cases will ever come about. That it's only through trial and error that you actually get greater learning and experimentation and then ultimately progress and prosperity. The precautionary principle shuts all that down. It basically says, well, we have to assume the worst could happen and we have to stop it. That's static, stasis-minded thinking that is really disastrous for innovation and progress. So what do we do in a case where something's not just regulated, but it's been regulated out of existence? Um, what immediately, what immediately comes to mind for me is um, that in Australia, nuclear power is outright banned. Uh, how do you work from a permissionless innovation standpoint on a regulation that's an outright ban on something that you think is good and should be allowed? Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, it's very much dependent upon the nature of the technology or the service we're talking about. There is just no way, for example, that if you want to start, say, a new supersonic transport jet in this country, that you can just go out and start flying one around. <laughs> that's an easy target for regulators to go after, and you better believe they're going to. Plus, you've got to get landing permits, and you've got to get a lot of other things you've got to do at airports. Um, likewise, uh, if, if you're providing uh, nuclear power and all of a sudden zero it out, well, it's not just the kind of thing you're going to go fire up down the road easily, right? There's a whole bunch of things that are entailed in it. So sunk costs matter. You know, fixed sunk costs matter. If you look at how much it costs to get a service off the ground or how much it costs to continue to run it, and then you consider fact and you factor in how big it is, how physical it is of a thing, those are going to make easier targets for people of a precautionary mindset. There's not an easy way to break that logjam. Now, in many, many other sectors, we are lucky because they're easier to move around or they're less tangible, uh, especially when they're like digital services and things like that. That's where a certain amount of sort of, sort of evasive entrepreneurialism can actually work some real magic. Um, but even like something like Uber, we're talking about taxi cab services, right? That's a very physical thing. You can find these cars, but they were able to make that play and make it work. So the answer, again, is it depends, um, and it's going to just be a much, much harder lift for old industrial physical things like big factories or power plants or airplanes or large medical devices that have to be sold somewhere. Those are going to be easier regulable targets, and the precautionary principle is harder to beat back there. It takes a lot of hard work to document like what the alternative better scenario is when it's not allowed at all. Right? It's hard to tell Australians, like, this is how much better it could be. That all you can do is look at the natural real world experience with nuclear power in other countries like France and say, we could derive some lessons from this. These are not two radically different countries. And so you can use natural real world experiments as the basis of policy uh, change. Um, after that, you can do some modeling and you can say, let's build some assumptions into like what we're doing today in terms of power production and what we could do tomorrow and what are the trade offs there. And then maybe in some cases, you can engage in actual smaller experiments within operational permit boundaries. So this is something that's happening. I'm documenting a lot of my work today. An emerging growth of what I call soft law, a whole body of sort of more informal governance mechanisms for emerging technologies. This can include uh, a variety of different kinds of approaches and procedures. But one type of procedure that many regulators are starting to think about more seriously is policy experiments or sort of like geographically contained kind of zones of freedom, if you will. In some cases in the fintech world, these are referred to as sandboxes, where you can go to a regulator and you can say, can I get permit to do this interesting cryptocurrency application over here in this state, even if I don't have permission in the other 49? Or in the, in the context of like driverless cars. There are states that have welcomed with open arms, you know, anybody who wants to send their driverless car fleet down to Arizona, they can do that and they'll get more operational freedom to, to innovate and to, to, to experiment than they will in California. And that's exactly what's happened. All of the driverless car innovation moved from California to Arizona. And so hopefully we can try to give trial and error another chance. If even in a limited way for those heavily regulated sectors. But I gotta tell you, I'm very pessimistic we're gonna do that with nuclear power and I'm 
really sad about that because I think that's one of the things that could do the most good if we allowed for more. I'm going to put you on the hot seat here. 737 max. You have 30 seconds. Go for it. <laughs> Very serious uh, safety issues associated with the 737 MAX, and we had a very sophisticated precautionary regulatory process to deal with them. So how could we make that regulatory process better? You know, where, where were the fail points? How can we address them? And also, let's not forget that when it comes to something like a catastrophic failure like that, we also have to discuss the governing role of tort liability and the fact that there are other types of remedies that will kick in. There's also the market reactions. If you take a look at today's Wall Street Journal B1 section, it talks about the hit that the U.S. economy is going to take because of the 737 crisis for Boeing and all the production lost because of all the value it's lost to the market. So there has been a reaction to that. It's not perfect, but it begs the question, how much more precautionary could we have been in those cases, right? We could get into another debate that would take more than another 30 seconds about the role of automation in planes, trains, and automobiles going forward? Because that's the really interesting question. Should there even be any more pilots to train flying airplanes going forward? You just mentioned tort law to Jordan, so prepare for another 20 minutes of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I am thrilled to have that word come up in this conversation because I think that that's what it all comes down to is considering legal institutions that can handle a lot of these questions for us without having to have a Washington-based or even state capital-based um, alleged solution. Amen. I mean, th this comes down to the difference between ex-ante precaution and ex-post reaction, right? And sometimes the ex-post liability types of approaches that we have can provide adequate remedies to problems that have developed that then create an incentive to be safer the next time around. Now, not perfectly so. This is another interesting discussion, going all the way back to my discussion of Aaron Wadolski. He pointed out that tort law in America has some strange quirks to it, starting with the fact that we don't have a loser pay rules, and there's a sort of perverse incentive for people to file a lot of lawsuits anytime there's any even a small little problem. That can deter a lot of important innovation. Uh, there's also another question, which is that tort law became far more redistributionist over the last 40 or 50 years, where there's a search for deep pockets. Mm -hmm. And it's like, who can pay us the most, regardless of who's actually to blame or if there was anything that really deserves that much of a, a reward? So tort law is not perfect. But I would argue it's still a superior tool in most cases to the preemptive ex-ante kind of approach that would just shut down all innovation as we know it. At least the, the responsive ex-post tort approach allows innovation to happen. And it can be supplemented with other types of ex-post regulations. For example... I think it's a smart idea to have a robust recall authority for our National Highway Traffic Safety Administration for when things go wrong with automobiles. That's smart. If something went wrong, bring them back, do the repairs. But you know what? They're not stopping all cars from getting on lots across America. That's the approach we have for planes. And it takes us, therefore, 10 years to get, like, the, the Dreamliner in the air or something. And there's still, of course, problems. But at least in the automotive context, we've got a better approach mirroring up tort law with the sort of recall authority and a variety of other federal motor vehicle safety standards. That's a pretty good approach in my opinion. And it's tragic that in this instance of Boeing having some issues with its uh, production, it's impossible for there to be a real competitor that can emerge quickly to challenge their, their dominance of the market. And, and of course, regulation isn't going to help that, right? You, you want to talk about regulatory capture and other problems. Um, you know, it's not just Boeing. You know, a lot of High, highly fixed cost, you know, resource intensive, capital intensive industries, you tend to have a couple of players and you really want to see more competition innovation there. But regulation actually makes it even more expensive to get in. The entry barriers are higher than just the cost of the items. It's the actual amount of lawyering staff you've got to hire to even know how to navigate the, com the complex maze of rules and regulations at the federal, state, local, and maybe international level, right? And so a lot of people just forget that. And they just end up saying, oh, capitalism, all oh, these companies. Well, how do we get more of these companies? How do we get more competition? They don't think through the dynamic effects, right? And ultimately, it's the precautionary principle and the, the regulations associated with it that ultimately discourage the competition innovation that we should all want. Is there anything else that we forgot to ask you, didn't ask you, that you think that would be important to share with our listeners? 
Well, no, that was a wide-ranging conversation. I appreciate you having me here today to, to discuss these matters. I will say this, that um, a lot of these issues were talked about in my last book on permissionless innovation, the continuing case for comprehensive technological freedom, and then a new book out in April on evasive entrepreneurialism and the future of uh, technological governance, where I actually try to ask some really hard questions about uh, the limitations of both uh, the precautionary principle and permissionless innovation and talk about hybrid governance models for emerging technologies, including ones that people feel have really serious existential forms of risk. So I want to make sure your listeners understand that I'm not just saying complete anarchy should rule the day here. Um, I actually take seriously everything people of a precautionary mindset argue. I never, ever dismiss their fears because Nine times out of 10, they're valid. There's something to them. The problem is the way they translate those concerns into public policy as a default that says, thou shall not, or mother may I. Because when that happens, we stifle the very trial and error learning that is necessary to understand how to have a more prosperous uh, civilization. Wonderful, we'll make sure to put uh, links to those in the show notes. Thank you. Thanks so much for talking to us today. Appreciate it.